Innal hamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa natubu ilayh wa nusalli wa nusallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in First of all my dearest sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I ask Allah Ta'ala that you all in the best of iman and inshallah you're all really looking forward to this year's Ramadan with, with, with great hope, inshallah, for, you know, a really, you know, Ramadan that really revives our hearts, especially we, we went through, I know, especially you in Melbourne, I, I have to really acknowledge that you've gone through a lot of struggles, you know, more than what we went through, I believe, in Sydney. And I ask Allah Ta'ala that this Ramadan is, is just really amazing for all of you, inshallah, you know, um, to make up for your, the hardships that you've gone through, in, you know, in the past year. Um, but anyway, on to the topic, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, and, and that is um, exactly what Ustaz um, Naima was mentioning. And, that, you know, the, the, one of the common struggles that a lot of people have when it comes to Ramadan is how to stay motivated, you know, and keep the momentum going throughout Ramadan. Now, especially if you're a person who has a lot of uh, responsibilities on your shoulders or if you're, you know, someone who doesn't have a very solid daily routine of ibadah normally, then the thought of Ramadan and, you know, all the expectations of what you're supposed to be doing in it could feel quite overwhelming to you. I mean, even if you're a new revert, for example, it, it could seem all very overwhelming, the amount of um, acts of worship that's, you know, within Ramadan. So that's why I want to, you know, basically share with you today some of the tips for how you can help yourself to stay motivated throughout this month despite whatever situation you happen to be in. So first of all, you know, starting out, you know, don't lose sight of the overall aim and goal of Ramadan. I think this is, this is the number one important step towards staying motivated, right? Because a lot of people get caught up with the idea, you know, of all the extra actions we're supposed to be doing. Right? They're just thinking about all the different actions we've got to do and they may have checklists like with about like 30 things on the checklist that you're supposed to do this every single day. And then if you do that, it, it, Ramadan will, ends up becoming quite mechanical. Okay, So what happens when you do that is that you actually lose sight of the whole purpose of what Ramadan is supposed to be about, you know, with the whole point of Ramadan, which is getting closer to Allah Ta'ala, that's our main That's our main goal, right? To really draw ourselves close to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala in this month. And the other thing is to, you know, basically realign yourself with your true purpose of creation. And as we, Allah, we know, Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقُتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have not created the jinn nor the human beings except to worship me. And this is what Ramadan's about. You're coming back to that true purpose of your creation, right? Um, so this is why one of the, the advices that I normally give to sisters, if you can, is to, you know, try to treat Ramadan as if you're going on like a spiritual retreat. You know, the idea is to try to slow down as much as you can in this month and, and basically break away from the dunya, you know, as much as you can. We can't all do that, but as much as you can, try to sort of withdraw yourself at least to a certain extent from your normal dunya activities, if you can say it like that, and just allow yourself this time to focus on your ibadah. Because, look, the honest truth is if you're not doing it in Ramadan, when are we going to do it? You know, life's going by. So if we're not making the most of Ramadan, then when are we going to start making the most of, of you know, most of our time to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And, you know, the other thing is to, to, to realize how much you're actually in need for this ibadah. You know, what is the ibadah ultimately? It's, we don't do ibadah for Allah, right? Yes, he commands us to worship him, but he does not benefit from our ibadah. Rather, who are the ones who benefit from this ibadah? It's ourselves. And how we benefit is that it nourishes our souls. Okay, so that's, that's the amazing thing about Islam. Islam recognizes that we're not just you know, bodies and minds, but we are, we made up of soul and the soul needs nourishing. Just like, just as we look after our, our bodies with our, with our diet and those things. Similarly, we, we have to take care of our soul. And, and we see in today's society, 
with you know you know with materialism on the rise this is the thing that's lacking in people's lives right taking care of the soul and nourishing the soul they don't have that and that's why there's so much emptiness in the world right all right so that's why sisters what i'm trying to say is you know try to simplify your routine as much as you can in, in ramadan see a lot of people they put on extra things onto themselves like they've got their normal routine and they're, just, they're adding on all these extra stuff into their routine but what you want to try to do as much as you can is to simplify your routine as much as you can like what i mean by that is if you can cut down on any extra appointments even extra housework that you don't really need to do you know try to cut back on that like I always advise people to try and get it all done as much as they can before Ramadan starts, you know, just so you can just take this time out to really focus on your ibadah. Also, if you've got like work commitments, study, you know, try as much as you can to work around Ramadan or, you know, cut back on anything you don't have to do now, at least during the last 10 days of Ramadan, right? Last 10 days of Ramadan, especially in the odd nights, you want to at least try to be you know, at your maximum level of focus in, in, in that time. And um, just generally try to reduce the, the, you know, the usual outside noise that we, we open ourselves up to. You know, like I'm talking about like watching TV, I'm talking about, you know, social media, I'm talking about like socialising that we normally do, right? Anything that we no which would normally like, you know, anything that's basically going to distract us from being able to, you know, stay focused in this month, we want to cut back on that. I'm not saying you completely get rid of it, right? I'm not saying you have to completely cut these things completely out of your life because most likely you won't get through the whole month without those things, right? But what I'm trying to say is um, just be very mindful of how much time we waste on those particular things and just try to slot them in in times where, you know, that it's not it's less distract, distracting to yourself. And basically what I'm trying to say with this first point is, you know, can, what you need to be doing is continually reminding yourself of the ultimate aim of Ramadan because this is one of the greatest ways to keep yourself on track during this month. Okay, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing, the second tip that I want to give is, you know, from the most important things we need to pay attention to when it comes to Ramadan in order to be motivated is the state of your heart, Okay. So, you know, if you want to, you know, if you want to do your best in this month, then the most important thing that you need to do, first of all, is, is obviously purify your intention. Um, Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Quran, that if Allah knows that you have good in your heart, he'll give you good in return for that. So what does that show you? It shows you that, we need to realize that, you know, attaining success in this month all begins with yourself and, you know, and, and how much you truly want that from your heart. Because if you want that, Allah will never let you down. Allah Ta'ala will enable you to, you know, to achieve your aims. بِإِذْنِلَّهِ. And then the other thing is to know that the, you know, when you know that the ultimate goal of Ramadan is to gain the taqwa of Allah, right? We know that the ultimate aim of Ramadan and fasting is to gain the taqwa of Allah Ta'ala and also, you know, to uh, gain his forgiveness, his maghfirah in this month, then we need to keep our hearts focused on that target, right? That's your target you're aiming for. You want the forgiveness of Allah in this month. You want to increase your iman in this month. You want to come closer to Allah Ta'ala in this month. And so you put your trust in Allah Ta'ala that he's going to help you to achieve that, right? Because, you know, again, Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ Whoever sincerely believes in Allah, then he guides their heart. Another ayah, he says, Right? That those who strive for our sake, we guide them to our paths. And Allah Ta'ala is with those who do the righteous deeds and who are from the muhsinin. All right, so this shows you how as long as you have that, you know, uh, goal, you know, you're firmly keeping your eyes on that goal, Allah Ta'ala will, will give you this success, inshallah, in achieving that goal. The other thing too in, in, in regards to, um, you know, preparing your heart as well is, is it's very important to do tawbah, 
it's you know very highly recommended that you know before coming coming into Ramadan you, you you take some time out from your busy schedule and just you know basically you know sit with yourself have a your real you know honest look at yourself um and just try to ask Allah Ta'ala to you know forgive you for any sins you've done you know you know forgive you for misguidance that you've fallen into you know things you, you you know how can I say shortcomings you've had right because you know we have to realize dear sisters that ultimately none of us is able to do even one hasana in this month unless Allah Ta'ala guides us and gives us the tawfiq to do that right unless Allah guides us and gives us the success to be able to do that so this is why it's actually very important in order for our hearts to be receptive to Allah Ta'ala's guidance in this month, right? To get that guidance from Allah, it's very important we ask Allah Ta'ala, you know, to remove these sins and to remove this like blackness that comes in our hearts from these sins that, that have built up in our hearts over the year. And, you know, even if you think about like bad feelings that come in our hearts, right, towards others, like maybe it's, um, we might have a bit of jealousy towards others, might be a bit of hatred, you know, bad feelings. All of that can cause your heart to become blocked, you know, from it could be like an obstacle, you know, towards getting closer to Allah Ta'ala in this month. And we don't want anything. We don't want, we don't need anything else to be an obstacle between us and getting close to Allah Ta'ala in this month, right? Um, so this is why um, I'm saying to you that it is really highly recommended that, you know, we take some time out to do tawba before Ramadan comes to try to remove this, this heaviness that could be, you know, there on our hearts that could, you know, prevent us from, from being guided by Allah Ta'ala, basically. And then uh, another, another thing I wanted to mention as well in relation to how to prepare yourself for Ramadan is to try to come to Ramadan in a similar way to how you would be if you were meeting with Allah Ta'ala, right? Just imagine now, Subhanallah, may Allah, Allah Ta'ala all give us this blessing of, you know, meeting with Allah and seeing Allah Ta'ala in the next life. But imagine how would you be in that state, right? How would your state be, right? A state of brokenness, a state of, you know, feeling unworthy before Allah, you know, a state of feeling an absolute um, need for Allah Ta'ala, need for his help, need for his forgiveness, right? Um, so if you can try to think about coming to Ramadan, as if, you know, come to Ramadan in this type of state, okay? Because if you can come to Ramadan in this type of state, then this is what will cause Allah Ta'ala to, you know, to be with you, inshallah, and to um, to, to aid you in, in achieving your aims, okay? And this is basically, we can describe this state as, you know, having al-istislam to Allah Ta'ala, you know, having like absolute, you know, uh, submission to Allah Ta'ala and, that is the ultimate meaning of al-Islam, right? So you're, you're having that um, submission to Allah, you're being in line with your state of being a Muslim. And the, why I'm saying this is important is because you have to understand what is the, the heart, what is the status of the heart in relation to the rest of the body, right? The status of the heart is that it is like the king of the body, okay? So if meaning that if you rectify your heart, right, if you can get your heart in a state of having at least Islam, like I said, to Allah, in a state of submission to Allah, then it would lead the rest of the body to also, you know, go into that state as well. And so therefore, you'll find that your body will feel motivated towards action. Okay, so this is uh, what we see in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said, Ala wa inna fil jasadi mudra. Right, in this hadith, he says that um, verily in the body there is a clump of flesh that if it's, uh, if it's you know, rectified, all of the body will be rectified. And if it is corrupted, then all of the body will be corrupted. And verily, it is the heart, you see. So it all starts with the heart. Okay, if we can get our heart into the right state, then the body will uh, follow on with that. Okay, so this is the other very important point that I want to mention in relation to how to stay motivated, right? Come back to the heart and begin with your heart and you'll find everything else inshallah will 
fall into place. All right, next point is to be flexible with your Ramadan goals. Okay, so no doubt it is obviously recommended to have, you know, goals for what you want to, want to achieve uh, each day do, during Ramadan, but it's also important that you be flexible as well. And, um, you know, don't beat yourself up. Like, don't beat yourself up if, if you don't get to actually achieve you know, all of the goals you want to, you know, do um, due to, you know, your individual circumstances getting in the way, right? The, the very important point I want to stress on here is that, you know, we need to keep in mind that Allah Ta'ala rewards us according to the level of our ikhlas, right? The reward you get for whatever you do for Allah Ta'ala is according to the ikhlas you had and how much you tried, right? How much you tried. That's what Allah Ta'ala is looking for. So even if you couldn't necessarily achieve everything you wanted to do, but as long as you were very sincere and you tried your best, that's, Yani, that's what Allah's asking from you. And the other thing is we have to realize that obviously we all have unique life circumstances. So it's not a good idea to compare what, what you know, compare what you're able to do to somebody else. Like a lot of sisters and even brothers, and you know, one of the things that they'll you hear a lot of them complain about is they. They feel like just so sometimes hopeless even that they haven't really done anything that they um, would have liked to have done in Ramadan. Um, they compared to other people what they were able to achieve and they see all these people doing all these amazing things in Ramadan and then they're feeling like basically hopeless, right? Um, we, we have to realise that we all have, you know, different life circumstances and, you know, and, and there, are, there are from amongst us those who are not able to, you know, delegate those circumstances to others, right? Not everybody can go and drop their responsibilities during Ramadan, right? You've got amongst us people, for example, who might be a carer for a special needs child, you know? You've got for amongst us people who um, have an elderly parent, okay, so that they have to take care of. They can't just go and, you know, delegate that responsibility to somebody else. So, you know, if you're in those unique type of situ situations, then it's really important that you don't compare yourself to others, and, um, you know, actually the best thing you can do in that situation is to, what I say is basically embrace your, your circumstances, you know, realize that this is what Allah Ta'ala has chosen for you. And basically, you know, seek nearness to Allah Ta'ala by accepting what he's chosen for you and, you know, strive for his sake through what you need to do, what your, your responsibility that Allah has given you, right? Um, one of the ayats that I personally, you know, love is the ayat which Allah Ta'ala says, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَبِذَلِكَ أُمِرْتُ وَأَنَا أَوَّلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Right? Allah Ta'ala says in this verse, say verily my, my prayer, my sacrifice, my living, my dying is all for the Lord of the worlds, la sharika la. I do not make, I do not take any partners with him. Wa um, and and with this I was ordered, and I am from the first to be from amongst the Muslims. Now, why do I love this ayah? Because what this ayah says to you is that no matter what your circumstances may be, but this ayah gives you the mindset towards what you need to do. Right? It gives you the mindset that you need to have towards everything that you do, that in other words, your whole life is for Allah Ta'ala, right? That you live lillah, for the sake of Allah, fillah and billah, right? So you live for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, um, billah with his help and uh, fillah, you know, following, following, you know, his orders and staying away from his prohibitions. And so you make your whole life for the sake of Allah Ta'ala right? Despite whatever circumstance you have. And that gives you the mindset for when you wake up every morning, that that's how your aim, no matter what you have to do each day, but that's your aim to live your life for Allah Ta'ala, despite what your, whatever your circumstance is. And the other thing to realize too, sisters, is that, you know, even in the case of the Sahaba, not every, not every Ramadan that they lived through was one that had, you know, perfect circumstances for worship. Right, not every Ramadan they were just able to just like 
pray all night and, you know, fast all day and just focus the whole time on, um, you know, on worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You would find that there were years where they had to go out for battles. There were years when they were dealing with the loss of loved ones. You know, all these different uh, trials that come by in our lives. Okay, so we shouldn't expect that every Ramadan that's going to come by is going to be one that has all those perfect circumstances. All right, some Ramadans are going to come along, which we're going to need to seek nearness to Allah Ta'ala through basically our patience in that month, right? That we're going to be, you know, seeking closeness to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala through our patience with whatever He's, you know, destined for us in that month, more than being able to perform many extra acts of worship. And may Allah make us easy, make up, make, you know, all of our affairs easy for us when those times come by. Because obviously it's, 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 it's not easy for anybody, right? But this is why also Allah Ta'ala actually um, shows us that there will be times in life where we are going to be busy and we are going to be distracted from being able to worship Allah in the way that we would like. If you look at um, the end of Surah Sharh, for example, Allah Ta'ala says, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ Right? So basically in this ayah, what he, Allah Ta'ala is saying is that when you become free from the affairs of this dunya and what's keeping you busy and distracted, you know, from the, you know, the busyness of this dunya, the things that you need to do, then when you finally get yourself out of that stage, then dedicate yourself completely to the worship of Allah Ta'ala, right? You know, have that energy and focus towards worshipping Allah Ta'ala whenever you find those times where you're free from that feeling of, you know, overwhelm and busyness. So that's, that's, that's something that Allah Ta'ala has acknowledged that will be part of this life for us. Now, I just wanted to spend a bit of time here also speaking about some of the um, specific things that you can do to maximise your Ramadan. This, is, this part of my talk here is particularly aimed towards those who have a really busy schedule, okay, like uh, those who maybe have to work during Ramadan, they just they don't have a choice, um, those who maybe have small children and they just find it hard to find time, you know, like it's very hard when you've got a lot of responsibilities and everybody else is enjoying Ramadan and you feel like you're just caught up so much with your responsibilities, okay. So I'm just going to go through a few points that can help with this. So the first thing, um, obviously, you know, time management is obviously important, no doubt. Um, but look, we have to prioritize. Like, we, we're never going to stop being busy. That's the reality. We're all busy, and when it, that busyness is, it, there's always going to be a certain level of busyness, no matter what we do, right? So, if you're really busy, then you're going to have to prioritize certain times for that extra ibadah that you want to put in. Um, so, for example, um, for most people. It will, it will most likely be after they've had suhoor and then, you know, they've, they've prayed fajr, if they're able to, um, you know, sit and read some Quran for a while after fajr, you know, do some adhkar, do some dhikr. Um, that will probably be the ideal time for a lot of busy people. And they might not get a lot of time to do, you know, that, that sitting during the day. Um, but anyway, the other time, obviously, for, for mothers can be um, often the duha time. So, you know, around about 10 or like 9 or 10 or maybe 11, they put the baby down or something like that. They could have a bit of time to maybe, um, you know, sit and do some Quran then. And then obviously before going to sleep as well. Sometimes people they find just before going to bed, maybe half an hour before going to bed, they've got a bit of time to, to do a bit of extra, um, you know, ibadah at that time. So, look, but the main thing is that, you just got to find that time, you know, those little, um, what would you call them, slices of time, because that way when you go to bed at night in Ramadan, you feel like at least you've done something, you know, besides I'm talking about on top of your FOD here, right? Obviously you're praying your five prayers on time, you know, you're fasting your day of Ramadan, but I'm talking about those extras that you want to try to get in as well. And um, obviously you want to get in some um, tarawih prayers as well. Um, so that would be obviously be before going to sleep. And then the other thing to try to do is to, you know, incorporate dhikr throughout your day as much as you can um, with whatever you're doing. Like dhikr is one of the easiest things 
to incorporate with whatever you're doing. And you notice that if you look at the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we see how subhanAllah is basically a dua for every single thing you do, right? When you go out of the house, when you come in the house, when you go in the car, before you go in the bathroom. So if you try to, as much as you can, actually implement saying those du'as, but besides that as well, just in general, like you're driving along, subhanallah, subhanallah, wa bihamdihi, right? Um, you know, or, you know, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, saying those easy, um, you know, easy type of dhikr that is, it's so light on the tongue and yet they're so heavy in the scales of Allah Ta'ala. So, you know, don't waste your chances. Like you, as I said, you're in, you're in the car, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, going along. Try to really incorporate the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala. You know, you're, you're cooking, um, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Like try to say whatever dhikr is easy for you. Um, Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Uh, just try to incorporate it as much as you can in your day. Um, realize as well that the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala is actually what brings barakah into your day. So even with the best time management, nothing compares to the barakah that the, the, that the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala can bring into your life. SubhanAllah. And that's, that's exactly why when Fatima radiallahu anha complained to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about the amount of work she, you know, had to do and, you know, she asked for actually a servant to help her with that work. We see what did the Prophet ﷺ tell her? He told her to say before going to sleep, subhanAllah 33 times, alhamdulillah 33 times, Allahu Akbar 34 times, and that that would be better for her than a servant. Because if she does that before going to sleep, she'll find barakah in her day. And she'll find, you know, a strength from where she never imagined, subhanAllah, to be able to cope with her, her you know, daily burdens. So we have to realize that, um, you know, in Islam, it's not just about the material, um, the material means that we take. You know, you could sit there and plan your time management and all that, but you have to realize we believe in like, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, like we, we believe in, you know, like barakah, the barakah that Allah Ta'ala puts in our life. And, and one of the ways to get that barakah is, is the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala. The other thing too is that, um, uh, from the ben benefits of dhikr is that, you know, it elevates the status of whatever type of ibadah you're doing. So, you know, talking about people who are really busy, one of the things they want to try to do is like maximize, uh, you know, the ibadah, like maximize the act of worship you're doing. How do you do that? You make it heavier in the scales, right? You make it more weighty in the scales of Allah. And one of the ways to do that is by doing a lot of dhikr. If you're fasting, for example, like, Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimallah, he says that inna afdala ahli kulli amalin aktharuhum fihi dhikran lillahi azza wa jal. Right, that um, verily the best of every, you know, the best of those who do any type of action are the ones who remember Allah Ta'ala the most. And then he says after that, that the, the best, and so therefore the best of those who are fast are the ones who, mo who do the most dhikr of Allah Ta'ala while they're fasting. And similarly, the, the best of those who go to um, go to, for hajj are the ones who do the most dhikr of Allah Ta'ala while they're in hajj. Right, sisters? So this shows you, subhanAllah, that how much the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala can actually elevate the status of the active worship that you're doing. So that's why I'm recommending that, you know, if you're time poor, that try to do a lot of dhikr while you're fasting and be idni lahi ta'ala, this will increase, you know, subhanAllah, the rewards, inshallah, you get for your fasting as well. The other thing, obviously, too, with dhikr is that, you know, it brings you to a level of al-ihsan, right, where you're constantly mindful of Allah ta'ala in all that you're doing. And um, so that's, that's the other reason why, you know, your, that act of worship you're doing becomes heavier in Allah ta'ala's scales. Right. And the other thing too is that um, so to try to incorporate that dhikr in your in your day, like if you're at work, some of you probably work, um, you have breaks or you know you you finished doing something, you've finished doing a certain part of your work, do some dhikr of Allah. Get that dhikr in wherever you can fit it in. 
you know. Um, don't waste time when you're communicating to and from work or from uni. You know, use that time to recite the Quran or at least listen to the Quran. So what I'm trying to say is just try to slot in the dhikr wherever you can, basically. All right, another, another um, tip here is to aim for quality over quantity, right? So, you know, when you're time poor, you don't have a lot of time to do extra ibadah. So what you have to do is try, try to aim for, you know, um, this level of al-ihsan, which I was mentioning, which is as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us, and ta'abudu allaha ka'anna katarahu fa'in lam takun tarahu fa'innahu yaraq. That you worship Allah ta'ala as if you can see him and even if you can't see him, then know that he sees you. All right, so this is a high level. This is making your uh, ibadah at a higher level by you worshiping Allah ta'ala mindfully. So you're fasting mindfully. And obviously, if you're, you're fasting mindfully, then you're guarding your eyes from what Allah has forbidden you from looking at. You're, you know, you're guarding your ears from listening to what Allah has forbidden you from listening to. You're, you're guarding your tongue from saying what Allah Ta'ala is not pleased with you um, from, from saying. Okay, so that's how it brings you better to a high level. Similarly, your, your prayers. You know, whenever you do get the chance to pray when you're busy, try to pray with al -ihsan. Okay, where, you, you know, which will cause you to, obviously, you'll be slowing down in your prayer, you know, praying with khushua and, you know, turning your heart to Allah Ta'ala as if you can see him. So you, you actually enjoy the ibadah. You actually enjoy, uh, you know, worshipping Allah Ta'ala. Okay, so this is some of the, um, the, some of the things you can do when you're very busy. And, I mean, just quickly as well, obviously, there's a couple of other things like, obviously cutting out your time wasters because like look we all complain about not having enough time but if you take out all the social media time we spend um some people play games online take all, cut out all that and you'll, you'll be surprised how much extra time you have the other thing I, I also believe in is delegating tasks you know to other family members like everyone can help you know like i always tell my family right allah tells us to cooperate in al birdi wa taqwa, in um, you know, in righteousness and uh, and the taqwa of Allah. So this is all part of it that we work together as a family. When everyone takes a share of the burden, then we all have time, inshallah, uh, for our ibadah. Not just one person and you know is doing everything, and everyone else is um, enjoying themselves, and and everything's on one person. Okay, so we do have to try to delegate um, and those things. There's probably a lot more I can mention, but I don't want to. I don't want to go on too long for you all. Um, but anyway, uh, let me think. And so, okay, another thing, okay, because we're talking about how to stay motivated, right? So how to stay motivated, another uh, important point is, because what can happen to a lot of sisters is, you know, you have your non-praying days and your non-fasting days, right? Your menstruation comes and you're not praying and fasting. And then sometimes it's hard to get back into it again. So people experience like a bit of a dip in Ramadan due to that. So, look, when you go through that, um, what I advise you is um, don't let that dip happen. Like, just because you're not praying, just because you're not fasting, doesn't mean that you should, you know, yani, use that time to focus on doing other types of ibadah, right? You're not able to fast, you're not able to pray. All right, focus on other acts of worship. Now, I take the opinion that it's um, it's permissible to still recite Quran without touching it, Um you know, even if you've got your menses. So, I mean, I myself would be revising Quran during that time, um, you know, and then everyone, everyone of us believes you can do dhikr of Allah Ta'ala. But, you know, for other people, it might be, you know, you want to use this time to uh, cook for, you know, inviting people for iftar, right? So we know, we know that when we uh, cook for uh, fasting Muslims, that, you know, you get the reward, you feed a fasting Muslim, you get the reward, for their fasting without reducing from, from, from their reward for that fasting. And importantly as well here is that, you know, in the last 10 days, I just have to always stress this point, never think that just because you're not um, praying that therefore, you know, just go to sleep, don't try to seek out, um, you know, um, Laylatul Qadr. Some people think like that. They think because I'm not praying, I'll just go to sleep. Um, and they don't realize that the, it actually mentions in the hadith that, 
you know, Aisha, Aisha radiallahu anha mentions about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that he would ahil layl, like that he would uh, basically, um, you know, stay awake and worship Allah in these nights. And what's mentioned, men what's meant by, you know, worshiping Allah in, the, in these nights is not necessarily only praying. It could be dua, it could be dhikr, it could be uh, tawbah, you know, asking forgiveness from Allah Ta'ala, um, reciting Quran. Like there's, there's a lot of other things you could be doing um, during these nights if you're not able to pray. All right, uh, another advice how to stay motivated is don't burn yourself out. Okay, so some people get really excited about Ramadan. They race into Ramadan. They may overdo it. And then by after 10 days, you know, they might find it's really difficult to keep going, especially if they're not used to it. They don't, they don't have a solid, um, what you could call a bad routine outside of Ramadan. And so they start trying to do everything in Ramadan suddenly. So um, my advice is actually um, use the first 20 days to kind of go on a moderate pace where you just try to enjoy your acts of worship and try to, you know, keep your energy for the last 10 days. And for those people who don't actually have that solid um, ibadah routine outside of Ramadan, then a good idea can be to use those first 20 days as a practice for the last 10 nights. Okay, so use those first 20 days to kind of get yourself, you know, in a good routine. You, you're used to praying tarawih, you know, um, during the first 20 nights. And then when you come to the last 10, that's when you want to try to really uh, be at your peak if you can, be in there. Um, so I'll just mention a couple more points because I, I think I'm going making this, I didn't think this lesson was going to go this long. <laughs> it's got a bit longer than I thought. But um, anyway, so look, uh, another thing that I could try to help people with is try to think about what kind of person you are, right? And what I mean by that is we've all got different strengths and different interests, okay? We've all got different personalities and we have different strengths and we have different interests, okay? So you'll notice that the ibadah that Allah gave us, it's very varied, Okay, there's, there's such a huge variety and it suits, there's different types to be better for different types of people. So you, some people might find um, praying is heavy on them or they might find, um, you know, reading Quran is difficult for them, for example. So my advice, like, for example, maybe they love social welfare, right? They love helping others. They love, um, you know, cooking for others, helping sisters, things like that. Right, so if, if you're that type of person, then the best thing for you to do is to focus on the deeds that you find easy and that you enjoy doing. And when you do that, you'll find the sweetness of Iman that you get from doing those acts of worship will actually motivate you to um, towards, towards actually enjoying other acts of worship. Like, you know, you feel, alhamdulillah, that you get the sweetness of Iman, for example, from helping a sister um, organizing some sort of charity event or whatever's going on in Ramadan. And because you did that, you start to really enjoy your prayers and, you know, enjoy your fasting more. Okay. So this is um, just a tip that you can try. Focus on whatever strengths you have. Like some people, they love Quran more. Some people, they find pray, pray, praying is easier. So they like to pray lots of prayers. Whatever you like to do, just try to focus more on that. And that will help you to, to, um, have more energy to do the other um, acts of worship, inshallah. Another important point is um, making dua, uh, you know, and asking Allah basically to, to help you in this month to worship him in the best of ways, right? Um, why is that so important? Because ultimately the only ones who are going to be successful in this month are the ones who Allah gave them the tawfiq, right, gave them the success in this month. And um, the best of du'as that I could recommend to say in order to get a lot, you know, to ask a lot to help you is to say, Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Right? Oh Allah, I ask you, um, a'inni, I ask you to help me ala dhikrika to remember you wa shukrika and to, to, to be thankful and grateful to you and to have the best worship of you, right? So if you can try to 
learn that dua and say it a lot and be in Allah will give you tawfiq um you know in, in in staying motivated inshallah through through saying this dua and you know coming towards the end of um of of this talk inshallah and that is one of the ways that can help you to feel motivated and to keep that motivation going is simply just you know use your regret of your past to to help motivate you towards making the most of this month like if you think back on your past you think about sins you've done uh, neglect of like I have some people in, inboxing me right now asking me you know, about that they've missed prayers in the past they've missed fasting like there's so many things we've done wrong right there's so many things we've done wrong we haven't spent enough time worshiping Allah and our life simply our life is going so fast and before we know it our life is going to be over and we've hardly done anything right so when you think about that it's it's how like what greater motivator is that is there than that you know and then on top of that, what if this is our last Ramadan? You know, none of us knows how much, you know, how many more Ramadans we have and how many people we knew who were fasting with us last year, they're no, they're no longer with us, right? So this is, this is if, if there's any greater motivator, I don't know what's a greater motivator than that. And I think about what um, Ibn Ajawzi said, Rahimallah, he said that if it was said to those who were in their graves wish, they would wish to come back just for one more day of Ramadan, right? Because of how much blessings are in these days, how precious are these days and nights of Ramadan. So that's something to keep in mind. Use that, you know, the, the, the thinking about the regret of missing out on these days and thinking about your past, use that to help you to be motivated towards making the most of this month, inshallah. You know, finally, uh, you know, re- keep on reminding yourself of rewards for what you know for what for what you're doing you know all the rewards that Allah Ta'ala has promised us uh for for what we're doing in this month like for example you think about what um the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi tells us man sama ramadan imanan wa ihtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbi whoever fasted the month of Ramadan with sincere iman and hoping for the reward from Allah Ta'ala his previous sins will be forgiven and similarly, he says, "Man qama Ramadan imanan wahti saban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbi." Whoever you know stood in their prayers at night during during Ramadan, you know, with sincere iman and hoping for the reward from Allah Taala for doing that, then their previous sins will be forgiven. So you know, you are basically you know striving with your body in this month, you know seeking the forgiveness of Allah Ta'ala. You know, you're literally begging Allah Ta'ala to make you from those who will be freed from the hellfire in this month, right? Because we know that in this month, Allah Ta'ala frees more people from the fire than in any other month, right? So this is why, you know, sisters, this is what this is all about, right? So keep on reminding yourself of the reward of what you're doing. And I want to leave you with a beautiful quote from Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimallah, which will help you to work out if you're on track for achieving your goals in Ramadan. So um, Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimallah, he says, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِعَبْدِهِ خَيْرًا right? If Allah wants good for his servant, فَتَحَ لَهُ مِنْ أَبْوَابِ التَّوْبَةِ He opens for him the doors to tawbah and to regret and to, you know, brokenness and, you know, um, humiliation and not, not, you know, submission to Allah Ta'ala and, and feeling poor before Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala and, you know, seeking his help and turning to him sincerely and, you know, beseeching him in dua, right? Beseeching him in dua and, you know, seeking nearness to Allah Ta'ala through doing righteous deeds and staying away from uh you know, things that Allah has forbidden. So if you find in yourself, my dear sisters, even if you feel like you're lacking in this month, even when you look at everybody else, they seem to be doing far more than you, go back to this and have a look. Do you find that, you know, you find if you find yourself that, you know, you're constantly making tawbah to Allah in this month, you're feeling that regret, you're feeling that brokenness, maybe the unworthiness before Allah, you know, but you're seeking his help, you haven't lost hope in Allah, um, you're turning back to Allah Ta'ala, you're, you know, making dua as much as you can and, and trying to do as much 
uh, righteous deeds as you can that's in your ability. If you find yourself doing that in this month, then be in Allah Ta'ala, this is a sign that you're staying on track, even if you're not doing as much as what other people are doing. All right, sisters. So I'll leave it there. Um, I ask Allah Ta'ala that what I said is beneficial. Um, I ask Allah Ta'ala that I didn't, uh, you know, speak a bit too long for you. Um, there's a lot I wanted to get through and I, I could have actually said more, but then I realized it was just <laughs> going a bit long. But, um, you know, in finishing up, you know, I ask Allah Ta'ala to help us all, you know, reach Ramadan safely. And I ask Allah Ta'ala to bless us in this month and to make this month, you know, to make this month Ramadan from the best of Ramadans we've ever lived. I ask Allah Ta'ala to help us all to focus on the purpose of, you know, fasting and praying, uh, which is all to seek nearness to Allah Ta'ala. And I ask Allah Ta'ala to let us taste the sweetness of, of feeling close to him in this month. And I ask Allah Ta'ala to help us all be from those who get, the forgiveness of Allah Ta'ala in this month and that we are from those who are saved from the fire in this month and that we all enter into genital fuldals inshallah and that you know he not unites us all together in genital fuldals ya rabbil alamin wa sallallahu wa sallam wa nabiyyana muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in